Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Monday Night Masterclass. Sorry, we're a couple of minutes late. The technology is challenging us tonight. There's no doubt about it. Folks, we are in for a huge, huge night tonight. We're going to spend some time with Roman Dukowski. So, Roman, welcome aboard, mate. Thanks, mate. Nice to, ha- nice to be on board. Yeah, looking forward to an awesome night, mate. Talking about the big green fish, the Murray cod. I know it's a very, very popular species with a lot of people. So, and I've seen some of the vision that you've got for us tonight. It is spectacular. So, folks, uh, you are if you if you're a cod fisher, even if you're not a cod fisher, you're in for a, a real treat tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, folks, we are streaming out at the moment to a number of Facebook pages. So, we're out, going out to the Lawrence Facebook page. The Doc Lewis one, and we're going out to Roman's Facebook page as well. So wherever you're coming to us from, let us know. Put a a comment in the chat box. We can see the comments come in uh, wherever you're sending them from. We're also going out to YouTube as well. But let us know where you're coming from. Let us know where you like to do your fishing. And, of course, let us know if you can hear us okay, because it's terrible if you can't hear us. We might need to do something about that. But, Roman, we're going to chat just – uh, we, we're going to you know, chew, chew the fat for a little while, I guess, while we allow people to come into the room. So tell us a little bit about your fishing, mate. Where are you based and where do you normally fish? So I'm based in Canberra, so um, I primarily fish um, the urban lakes within Canberra. Lake Billy Griffin is where I cut my teeth on these big cod. Um, Gugong Dam, just on the outskirts of the ACT, the Murrumbidgee River through the ACT, and then down towards, you know, obviously fishing Burrajuk and um, doing a little bit of travelling as well. I fish... I fished up at Pindari Dam. I've um, done a fair bit at Windermere um, and that sort of stuff on the Yellow Billy Comp scene when I used to do it um, many years back. So, yeah, that's where I'm based here in Canberra and I'm um, just skirt off to the left or right or down the coast sometimes, you know, just in the hot spot, I think, of New South Wales for a mixture of different species. Well, it's nice and central, isn't it, Canberra? And I mean, even for those that like to do a bit of, um, you know, coastal fishing, it's not too far to go, but you've just got, in terms of the freshwater stuff, you've got so much within range of Canberra, you don't have to drive too many hours to get onto some, you know, quality cod waters. So yeah, that's, that's, a, right. that's a good place to be. So what, what style of fishing do you mostly do, mate? You, obviously, you're a lure fish, oh? Um, but, but tell us about the types of, uh, you know, the types of fishing. I believe your techniques are perhaps a little bit different to what a lot of cod fishermen are probably used to, which is one, one of the reasons I'm really looking forward to this episode. Well, it's been a bit of an evolution. So when I first came in the cod scene, it was literally just flicking lures in the river to catch my first Murray cod. Did that for a season and then um, discovered uh, the big Murray cod in Lake Burley Griffin and... Um, you know, casting spinnerbaits, mumblers and that sort of stuff and um, then, then just transitioning through to the different um, techniques and styles that have come across the last 10 years or so. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of vertical work, so I'm utilising my sounder, fishing um, deep to shallow water, working the bottom with lipless crankbaits and soft plastics and mm. swim baits in some instances as well. So it's a bit of a range. I've pretty much done it all, I would say, from what's come into the scene the last 15 years and um gone a little bit deeper in uh, vertical fishing and um yeah come up trumps the last few years and kept it under my hat for a little while but i think it's time to release the beast today so to you're say gonna, and, you're um, gonna spill the beans live on the yeah. uh, sonar master class awesome we, we don't stuff. have a lot we don't have the most time in the world so i'll, I'll get as much out, out as i can in a compact session and um anyone got any specific questions um i can touch on it quickly here and if you want to send me a message afterwards if you're looking for more detail you can do that through my facebook page roaming productions australia and um yeah that's essentially just a little brief um look at where i am at the moment with my fishing good stuff all right so we have got some people coming into the room now so we've got kelvin uh, kelvin's a regular uh um, masterclass attendee so welcome kelvin we've got peter k uh, from southeast Queensland. We've got Terry Gartland from down in South West Victoria. We've got Andrew Rutherford coming from Macquarie, Lake Macquarie uh, City Council. So welcome to all of you guys. Adam Robinson coming from the lockdown capital of Australia. Mate, I'm sorry that the fishing's off limits for you at the moment, but let us try and ease your pain by giving you uh, <laughs> by, by, by giving you some uh, information to get you started when you can get back on the water. So um someone's got hay fever no i don't have hay fever i must just be tired mate just saggy around the eyes from all the podcasts and streams that i'm doing so thank you for that one Stuart. uh mike const welcome mate ben o'brien welcome benny nice to have you here we've got dale swanick uh from upper burko uh matthew forbes is here marcos okay so we've got a whole bunch of people come in clint thurston 
uh, lots of people coming in. So thank you guys for letting us know that you're able to hear us all right. Uh, and, um, and yeah, thank, thank you for coming along tonight. And I promise you, we are going to have a great session. Now, uh, of course, we are here to talk sonar and we're going to be talking about how, um, you know, how do you sonar to find and target COD, Thomas Pinter, Zenko, welcome along. Um, so <laughs> Andrew Rutherford saying, not, not late Mac Council. Sorry, stupid Facebook, he says. So, well, <laughs> all right. So, folks, yeah, we are going to be talking about sonar, but uh, as we said, um, Roman does fish in very different ways to what a lot of other anglers do for cod. He does some of the standard stuff as well, but he also has some unusual techniques that he's going to talk about. So feel free to ask questions that aren't necessarily sonar related. And I know that Roman's got a whole stack of lures there in front of him to, to show you if you've got questions about lures or tackle. We're more than happy to, uh, to talk about those as well. So I'm putting that one up. We've got Dragon from uh, Wuhan, China. So th thanks for that, Dragon. Nice to have you here. Um, we've got plenty of people coming in. Bob Gordon, Mitchell Neal. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop reading out names. But um, yeah, thank you once again for, for letting us know that you're hearing us okay. So, Roman, mate, let's kick this thing off. So tell us a little bit about sonar and cod. Why do we need a sonar to go and target cod? Don't we just float around a lake casting at the obvious structure, logs, weed beds, all that kind of stuff? What's the well, what's the need for a sonar? Well, I used to, and a lot of people used to, um, just turn up to the dam, spot a rock wall, you know, chuck a spinnerbait on, or in these days, swim baits, and um, yeah, for gold, and um, just keep moving and find an active fish. Um, that has worked for me greatly over the past, but um, you know, as I mentioned, the last you know, handful of years I've um, really tuned into my sonar. Mm. Um, and that goes back to fishing the AYC fishing tournaments, learning a lot from my fishing partners and also the anglers on, on the water too, like Loomsy and Brownie. They've done great things and they've, um, um, they've just transitioned their knowledge in from Yellow Belly and I've sort of tuned in on that and learned how Yellow Belly work in dams and went a little bit further and decided to do similar sort of stuff in regards to fishing the bottom for cod. And, um, yeah, it came up really well for me. So um, essentially you, you just need to have all the technology on your hands. And we have some really good technology these days. So you can, you know, spot a fish out to the side in front of you, that sort of stuff. And it just gives you a little bit of a broad sense of what they're doing. And, um, you know, cod fishing is about... Um, noticing those really really small things whether that's temperature change or visual in the water um, so having the ability to spot that fish wherever wherever it is around the perimeter of your boat and then hone in on it and um, just learn from time on the water on you know there might be a fish sitting on the bottom that may look like a stick but in fact is a fish laying on its side that sort of thing um, you know, golden perch for example do like to sit on their side you know, you got them in a live well and they like to go on their side. As soon as you open the lid, they just, boom, come straight back up. And um, the fish do that as well. So, you know, cod do it. A lot of these fish do it. Um, and, yeah, just being able to hone in with the technology is pretty much the, the big thing about going out and taking advantage of what we've got now. Yeah. So, and obviously, you know, you're a Lawrence user and that's why you're here this evening. We are sponsored by Lawrence and, and by Navico. So thank you to those guys for making these uh, these masterclasses possible. But tell us about the unit that you've got on your boat, mate. So I've got a couple of units. Um, my primary unit is my Lawrence HDS Live. I've got a 12 and a 9-inch, and I've also got a hook reveal, which is um, an entry model but has side scan and um, all the important functions as well. So essentially um, they're the units that I run. I've also got the Lawrence Live side as well. Um, just to shoot out in front of the boat and, um, you know, tune everything in around that too. So yeah, having a quality sounder um, is uh, pivotal when you're talking about this style of fishing because you're trying mm. to work out those little, um, the, the really fine detail and having that clear image and, and rely on, you know, really good technology to do that is um, half the battle. Once you interpret what things are, then like everything, it becomes a lot easier. So um, I like to stick with my slightly larger units, so I wouldn't go smaller than a nine for my style of fishing. So um, 12 is just optimal. I mean, yeah. if I had all the money in the world, I would get 16s and have a few <laughs> of them on board. But, I mean, sometimes it's a little bit of an overkill on a small boat. But your 12 and your nine is that sweet point, I find. 
Yeah, yeah, good, good. All right, well, let's have a chat about Sonar in just a moment. Before we do that, we've got we have got our first question, and it's not about Sonar. So, uh, Josh was asking, winter time, do you use natural or colourful? So, I guess he's talking about lure colour here, mate. Yeah. Um, run down. Well, I guess it really depends on the waterway that I'm fishing. Let's just say Gurgong, for example. Um, very clean water most of the time. Um, and the bait fish, you've got a lot of redfin. You don't have carp in there. A lot of people think there's carp, but they're actually um, uh, like that native goldfish, um, the small stunty things that look like bony broom. Um, so pretty much matching the hatch. So when I go to lures for clear water, I look at what baits around. And um, for Gurgong, we've got redfin. So I use lures which resemble redfin. So we've got a storm plastic here. Um, the ROP shad. So that's one of my go-to colours when I'm looking at fishing in dams which have that redfin perch within. Um, and then you've got your other hard body lures as well. See a bit of redfin there. That's your Storm Arashi um, wide bait. And one of the other colours I really like to use, so even though we're looking at primarily redfin, so fairly natural coloured fish, um, I like to go something really bright as well um, and with the rip and wrap here, I've got a well, the camera, sorry. Um, I've got a really bright red, like in a crawdad colour. So um, I've switched around with a lot of different colours and a lot of the dams that I fish with, but it comes down to that good old, you know, confidence thing. Um, I'm confident in the redfin style colours and the, the really bright reds as well. Um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of chartreuse in um, most of the waterways that I fish in, but in other waterways, other species, chartreuse really goes well. So I guess what it comes down to is, one, what to praise about, two, what's the clarity of the water, and three, confidence. What are you confident in? Yeah, yeah, good stuff. All right, mate, we've got a couple of other questions come up, so let's go through a few of those, and then I know you've got quite a few screenshots there, and that's probably going to answer some of these questions as well. So if I put a question up, mate, that's going to be answered by a screenshot, let me know, and we can just skip over that and come back to it at the appropriate time. So... Um, this one might be though. So Andrew, uh, Andy Lindsay's asking, he's going to be fishing Barnjuck this coming weekend. Is it better to fish with large plastics, swim baits or spinner baits at this time of year? Uh, well, I was there a couple of weekends ago and um, I donutted. Um, I had three chances and one ripped my um, soft plastic in half. So um, just a day of misses for me. Um, but Barnjuck at the moment, um, from what I've seen about and what I've experienced the last couple of weeks when I was out there, was um, soft plastic, so your big, large plastics. Um, I would fish anywhere from 6 to 10 inch. I like to fish 8 inch, just right in the middle there. Um, and casting swim baits, glide baits, hard baits, they're all catching fish. It's just a matter of um, being out on the water, the time that the fish are firing and putting that lure right in their face. Um, that's what I've noticed. Um, you know, Dean Sylvester was out there as well, and just looking at some of his videos, you can see he's using the large plastics as well, mm. and he's um, come up trumps. So I'll stick with hard plastics, uh, sorry, soft plastics, and um, just fishing the top half of the water column and just nice slow retrieve, a couple pauses here or there, and just give the fish the opportunity to pounce. You often will get hits um, when there's a pause or you bend over to pick something up in the boat and that sort of stuff. So I reckon... They, they, know. Plastic, they know when you're paying attention, that's the... That's the way fish work. Exactly, exactly. There's <laughs> going to be a lot of influx of water and um, <clears throat> coming in Barranjuk, and there was when I was out there, even more so with the rain we've had now. So um, it may dirty up. So just take that into account when you take out, you know, your different lures. Just get a couple mm. of bright colours. Um, the Chartreuse colours is one of the dams that I like to use, and a, and a rainbow trout, like a really, really bright rainbow trout pattern, like in the Rapala x Petto. That's a fantastic colour for... Um, bar and Jack, and I've got plenty of meteries um, on that particular lure. So just work plastics. Um, that's what I would recommend as your number one option if you had to pick one. Plastics, then your your hard bodied um, glide baits or swim baits. There you go, guys. There's a rundown on Bar and Jack for you. So um, Linton's asking what settings to use on the Lorance for lakes. Now I suspect Linton, as we go through some of the screenshots, uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about those. Do you have any sort of general comments for that one? Uh, Ray, well, or do you um, want to leave that? Um, I primarily run auto for my settings. Um, I mean, if if I'm fishing a waterway which has a lot of clutter, then I'll adjust the sensitivity up and down. And if I'm fishing deeper water, I'll up the contrast, that sort of stuff. But generally, the sounders these days are um, 
you know, they're so well advanced that auto pretty much does what you need it to do. And um, I would say if I had to scale out of nine, out of 10, I would use auto nine times out of 10. So it's only mm. for those real um, off conditions that I'll start playing with um, the sounder itself. That makes it pretty simple. Hey, so look, we've got questions here from Matthew, uh, from Scott, uh, from Rob, uh, who else from Don? So, guys, we will come back to those questions. Keep putting them up, and if they don't get answered, don't be afraid to put them up a second time. We're happy to go through them and come back to them. Uh, I'm going to bring up the one from Scott though before we go into screenshots because it's an interesting question. I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are. So, Scott's question is: If we both had the same skill and you had a sounder, but I didn't, what do you reckon the catch difference would be? In other words, how important is the sounder? Extremely important. Extremely important. Um, it's. I guess it's a little bit less important when you know the fish is sitting up on the banks. Um, then you can just actively go and target the banks and, you know, just find that active fish, have one cast in a spot, move five metres across and that sort of stuff. But if we're talking about catching numbers and changes of seasons and different um, water depths and changes in depths and that sort of stuff, fishing weed versus hard rock bottom, some, um, some, some sand, that sort of stuff, definitely a sounder and um, – I use my sounder every time I go out um, and yeah, it definitely has increased my catch rate tenfold and that's no exaggeration. There you go. So that's the tip and that's why we're here tonight, guys, because the sounder can make a difference if you know how to use it. So let's get on to how to use it, mate. Shall I bring up a screenshot? Should we get started with that? All right, go lucky dip. Bring up anything. Let's do it. Let's bring up this one and see what you've got to say about this. So tell us what we're looking at, mate. All right. So this is um, a 130.5 centimetre Murray cod just tracking underneath the boat during a long fight. Um, you'll see this video actually of this fish getting captured from the start. Um, it's a long clip, so you're not going to see the whole clip. It's going to be a short snippet, but that's a big Murray cod. So the, in essence, if you have a line just coming across the screen like that, that fish is moving. So that is a big fish in about, I think it's 7.2 metres of water. Um, so the deeper the water, and the thicker the return means it's a really big fish. So let's just say there was a golden perch sitting there and it was only an average size golden perch, let's say 30 to 40 centimetres. It's going to be a tiny speck on that sounder, essentially. Um, so thicker the, the line, deeper the water, you've got a really big fish on. All right. Or, Should we move on? Move on to the next one. So we've got plenty of questions coming up. Keep asking them, guys. We will get to everybody's questions. So tell us about this fish, mate. Right. This is an absolute beast. And, yes, some people will say that's held too far out the camera. It is held out a little bit, but it's a massive fish. So this golden perch um, is my PB weight. It's not the longest that I've caught. This one's 65 centimetres. Um, this is vertically fishing, bouncing the bottom in springtime or late. Actually, this was summer. This was summer if my memory serves me correct. Um, and this one tipped the scales at just under nine kilos, and that's an absolute horse for a golden perch. Um, and out of Gugong, they're built like nothing else when it comes to native fish. They're just so thick and broad. And, yeah, that's that's a you know just a highlight of um, my golden fishing and um, doing exactly what I'm alluding to now is just working the lipless crankbaits on the bottom. That's a 70 mil lure. It's actually, you know, not as small as it looks. It's um, this lure here once I get the camera back up on me but you know it, it's a decent size it was crankbait and that's what that fish is about excellent well let's bring up a couple of questions then we'll move on because I know you've got plenty more screenshots to go through so Matthew's asking the question is there a lot of difference between the seven inch and the nine inch uh, screen with regards to picture quality or is it just a bigger picture uh, well, in the technical specs, I wouldn't be 100%, but in terms of what I can see, um, no, I don't see a huge difference. It's just being able to um, essentially, you know, group your screen up with um, more splits. Um, I don't notice a huge difference between the quality from the 7 or the um, 9. All right, so Don's asking what rod and reel combo do you use, Raymond? I'm guessing there's, uh, there may be more than one. I've got, I've got a lot of rods, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've got a few behind me, so I've only got four, but I'll show you the four that I use. Um, so when we're talking about vertically working with the crankbaits under the boat primarily, um, I'm using a Storm Discovery uh, rod. It's only a six 
foot rod. So it's in the in-between stage. It's not too long, not too short. Um, if you're talking about ratings, this one's a, reading it upside down, is an 8 to 17 pound. Um, and I like to use something that's just in that mid-range when I'm working vertically and casting out a little bit because um, it's not too... It's not too long and not too short and, you know, it's a lot comfortable in the hand and you're manoeuvring that rod often. So I think having a rod in the mid-length range is really important when you're working lipless crankbaits vertically and just a little bit outside the boat. Uh, the reels that I've been playing with at the moment um, are the 13 fishing reels. These are just a fantastic reel. With, uh, I'm not going to go too much into the reels. You look them up. They're a great reel. So that's primarily what I use with um, vertically working, and that's um, with 40-pound Suffolk 832 is my preference, and um, 40 to 60-pound leader, depending on where I'm fishing. Even when I'm fishing for golden perch at Gugong, um, I like to go at least 40-pound because they're such big fish, and you know it doesn't take them much to wrap you around a little twig or you know bury you into that weed. Mm. Um, so that's one rod. I'll, um, I've got the traditional jigging stuff, so this is more your... I guess more uh, your your saltwater uh, saltwater jigging style. So you've got your long handle. This is a Gamoku uh, Adajo, um, and I like to use these primarily when I'm working purely vertical. It's got that long handle, so you can tuck it under your arm. And often I jig with two rods, one in each hand, and um, yeah, that's a really good option if you're just really focusing on uh, vertical work. And then we're moving on to your um, casting rods. So everyone's using swim baits at the moment when they're targeting for cod, or most people are. So I'm using a swim bait rod here, and this is a um, Storm Adventure X rod. Um, it's in between in terms of it's not too heavy in the hand, um, but it's got a lot of power for such a fairly light stick, and you can cast with it all day and you know not get too tired. So I like to use a rod which is in between um, weights again, and this is a Rapala BC400 uh, reel, so it's quite large and in charge, and we've got 80-pound Suffolk 832 on that with anywhere from a 60 to 80-pound leader as well, and I like to use fluorocarbon when I'm casting or vertically working. Sorry, my room's a bit small here. And then I guess this is more your average-style um, casting stick for the larger soft plastics, um, not so much the really, really big swim bait stuff, but, um, you know, the Rapala x rap pedos, which are, you know, your 8-inch plastic hard body hybrids. Um, I like to use um, the, the Rapala Rapalero. It's a bit hard to say, but um, these are a really, really um, great rod, which is at the top of the range for the Rapala gear. Um, and this one's rated to, I've got two, one, I've got two. This one's 6.6 six, and um, this one's up to 14. 40 grams, so 14 to 40 grams, line weight 15 to 30 pounds. So that's just a quick look at, you know, what I fish with. Um, as, as alluded to, I fish with a lot of different things, but that's what I've been throwing around the last, you know, six to 12 months. I hope that answers your question, Don. Lots of different options there depending on exactly what you're doing, I guess. So we've got a question from John about whether fitting your sonar, so fitting your transducer to your electric motor is a good idea or not? What are your thoughts on that, Brown? Well, I haven't done it, so I'm not going to be too critical about it. Um, but the one thing that's very obvious, um, your trolling motor moves. So you, you're constantly going to be moving left to right and swinging yourself around. So if it's really windy and you've got spot lock, for example, and your trolling motor, you're not going to be able to control it. Um, if you want to um, also have a side imaging, like a three-in-one transducer, you're going to be switching around a lot. So it really just depends if you want to control your sounder. Um, I would personally suggest if you're an active caster at the front of the boat, just getting a pole set up and um, manually turning your transducer for wherever you're fishing, even in the wind. Um, but for me, I would just use a pole or um, just use the transom of the boat. Okay. So uh, Jack Lancaster is asking, do you sound up until you find a big fish? Or do you sound for bait, then fish interesting, uh, then, then fish interesting to know uh, or pick structural spot that looks good to fish? Well, I'll answer this. Yeah, a sorry if I got that question, mix that question up, Jack, but hopefully hopefully we've got the uh, the question laid out enough for you. So 
Okay, you I'll, I'll, I'll answer this with a visual for you as well. We have a screenshot, um, Greg, which um, has a Murray Cod sitting underneath a big bait ball of redfin. So if you just want to scroll through that one. Let me just, let me just bring up the... There we go. Go back one. That's one. the one. All right. So um, if I'm familiar with a waterway, I will tend to um, go over the top of an area and, and sound it. Um, I will have my side scan on, so I'll be able to see um, both sides of where I want to go. But um, let's just say I'm fishing a familiar waterway like Gugong. I travel and um, scan my fish uh from the top view, so I'm not relying too much on my side scan. I am keeping it on, though, so if I see something, I'll go over to it. Um, but essentially, I'm looking for uh, a fish. When I'm looking for Murray cod, they're not usually a schooling fish. Um, they can pair up, and you often do see them paired, but not usually any more than that. So I'm looking for individual fish that are close to the bottom or sitting on structure or underneath fish. So I'm actually looking for bait balls and big fish so that big arch that you're seeing there underneath that big bait ball of um, redfin i'm looking for it all so i'm sorry if that was a little bit um all over the place but i'm looking for everything when i'm out there and just um whatever i see i try and tailor my approach and if i see more bait more bait fish and i can't see those big fish i'm going to concentrate on those bait fish then i'm going to work those bait fish to get those fish to come in because wherever you have a bait ball there's always nine times out of ten going to be a predator near near about so you may not be able to see them initially but sit on that school of fish work them work through them to the bottom and if there's a predator around big cod will come in so just keep a close eye on your sounder because they will move through. And when you see something contrasting from those little dots and those little squiggly lines to that big solid mark, you know it's serious fish. All right, I'm going to bring up another similar question. We may have already answered it, but we'll just cover it off anyway. So Andy Lindsay's question is, if you don't see bait on a sounder or on the bank or edge that you're scanning, uh, but you know that you've had good luck there in the past. Do you move and find bait or do you stay in cast where you've had good luck before? Um, I do a bit of both. Um, there's often, you're often going to see fish and they're not going to be actually active, so they're sitting a bit higher in the water column, so a little bit opposite to bass and how Dean was explaining it last week. Um, the fish on the bottom um, are hard to catch in terms of the, the bass sort of stuff that Dean's done. So that's Dean Sylvester. It's the total opposite for um, the Murray Cod that I find. The fish that are on the bottom are the ones going to be easy to catch. So um, essentially I'm going out and I'm just scoping out what's happening and I will just continually move until I find that bait or that fish. You will find bait and you will find fish. Just don't stop moving. Um, and, I mean, if you want to cast the bank and you're over it, by all means do that, but that's not going to get you those special fish if you're just going to sit around and wait for them to come in. You have to see something, whether that's a little bit of a rise on the bottom or a little bit of weed, fish will be sitting in that weed or around those little um, isolated rises with nothing too much about. So just find something and just track it throughout your fishing experience. So throughout the weeks and months, let's just say in um, early December, uh, fish are going to move a lot. Just keep moving until you find something to target. Yeah, good stuff. Love this question from Graham. So Graham says, a lot of the hard vibes, like like the ripping wrap, are made for US largemouth bass. Can you comment on the strength of the standard split rings and hooks and the trade-off with running heavy lines and leaders for cod? Says, sure. Um, I've just frozen up here, so I'm just going to back out and come back in very quickly, so bear with me. All right, no worries. For those that are still with us, so Graham says he recently dropped a big fish because the upgraded trebles didn't sink in. So back. Excellent. All right. So uh, Graham also finishes off by saying that he recently dropped a big fish because the upgraded trebles didn't sink in. So what's the preference for line versus hook strength? Getting that balance right. Good question, Graham. There's a little bit of give and take. Um, I mean, Sometimes I upgrade, sometimes I don't. It really depends on what's happening at the time. Um, if the fish are really aggressive and they're hitting hard, um, I will generally upgrade to stronger hooks, but not necessarily the thickest hook. I try and get the strongest hook with the thinnest profile I can get. 
Um, and that's where I like to um, actually change from your actual trebles to your assist hooks. And um, a good assist hook that I've been using is the VMC. So these are, are marketed as a light jigging assist hook, 80 pound braid, but that's light in terms of the ocean. Um, these are a really strong hook, so it really just depends on the fish themselves. I won't just put on heavy gear for the sake of it. There's got to be a reason. Um, sometimes you won't get those hookups with a really thick gear. Like you said, you just lost a big fish, so it really is tailored to how the fish are actually responding rather than just putting something strong on and saying, I'm going for a cod, I'm going to get the strongest thing in the book. But we've got to remember, big Murray cod, out of um, dams, for example, let's just say Gugong, Blowering, uh, Eeld and that sort of thing, they're, gonna, they're so heavy. You're not mm. going to find a strong enough hook um, for these style of lures um, for them not to bend. So it really, you've got to just find a happy medium and just experiment with a few things. Um, split rings, I'll tend to upgrade them uh, to the next strongest, let's just say on a rip and wrap. But sometimes I won't. It really just depends on how the fish are um, acting at the time. Yeah, good stuff. Now, I'm going back to one that Rob put up a little while back. Sorry, I missed that one in the first pass, Rob. So Rob's asking for some recommendations for fishing Blaring Dam. Now, mate, we could do a whole series just on that alone, I'm sure. But perhaps if we could just get Roman to give us one or two tips and insights for that particular storage and we'll move on. All right. So I've, um, uh, all truth, I've only fished Blaring Dam twice. Okay, and it was the worst weather. We had like 50 <laughs> mils of rain that night. It was horrible. But um, Blowering Dam is similar to Gugong in terms of it. when I was there, it didn't have a lot of um, uh, hard wooden structure. So it was just rocky banks and a lot of weed. So um, my biggest uh, thing would be knowing your sounder, understanding what you're looking at in the water and just being able to clearly identify what's rock, what's weed, what's a fish, what's a big fish, what's a small fish. That's the key for fishing dams with a lack of structure um, above the water because you look at a bank which has not much on it, you're like, oh, that, that's a terrible bank. You're not going to be inclined to fish it. But if you've got a really good sounder, it doesn't even need to be that great. It just needs to be able to pick up what the bottom is and um, being able to track that. So that's my biggest key, number one, is having technology to help you. Um, number two is just doing the hard yards. I mean, I think this is going to increase your catch rate um, by 50% fish at night time. I mean, usually that's what people do. They go out there, fish for night time, do a trawl, do some casting, catch a fish. I may be wrong. I've only fished it twice, but from what I've seen over the years, nighttime is one of the big keys, particularly when it's hot as well. Yeah, I've had a couple of podcast guests who have talked about Blaring Dam, and that was one of the things that came up. But mind you, that's come up for a lot of dams as well. Nighttime, okay. they're obviously they're a nocturnal species, so they do tend to you know, be a bit more active at night. So, But one, one thing I would like to jump in here with, let's just say Gugong versus Blaring. Gugong is a day fishery. You can't okay. fish at nighttime. So mm. there is ways to actually... Um, uh, work out what's happening. I've had to do it the hard way. Um, Gugong was a little blip on the map when I started out, and then I had to really work hard to work out what was happening, and I only had the day to do it. So it is possible, um, but it, I mean, a lot of that was cast in the banks. And once the fish got used to what people were doing, they would change up, and that's where the sounder really helped me. So, sounder, mm -hmm. you can work it out. No matter how hard the fishing is, you, you can work it out. All right, so Linton's asking, what screen splits do you like to run? Screen splits, okay. So um, primarily I like to fish vertically. So I will run a um, traditional sonar on your left, downscan, and then also my structure downscan as well. That's my primary split um, with my little GPS, little slither on the side, so I have the three split. Um, that's primarily what I run, and you'll see in the screenshots, I think every screenshot actually is like that. So what you're seeing there is what I run. Let me um, bring that screenshot back up. So There you go. So um, I find a lot more of my fish going over the fish and working out what they're doing and staying put and just watching. So 
that's how I like to run my sounder, primarily on a standard split down the middle, one on the left, one on the right. Very good. Uh, Matthew's asked another question. Does a 12-inch give a better picture? So we're going from 7 to 9 to 12, and the answer is? That's, that's when you notice the difference, I believe. Mm. Um, again, a lot of that can be a trick on your eye, thinking that you've got more detail, but you've actually just got more screen to look at. Um, these days, the detail that you get from a 7 versus a 9 versus a 12 um, is not a huge difference, and it's more so if you want the ability to see multiple things at once is going to be the decision of whether going from a 7 to a 9 to a 12. Um, mm. The HDS lives are really clear at all aspects. So if you're talking specifically about that sounder, I wouldn't be too worried. I would go the higher or the bigger size if you want to um, learn more essentially at okay. a quicker, quicker time. All right, Mitchell, another one that we could probably run a couple of uh, complete sessions on, but what's the best way to set up a HGS version of Sounders? Uh, I mean, there's so much out there these days, just um, on YouTube, for example. Um, the Lawrence page has some really good um, mm. tips. Um, Dean Sylvester, I keep mentioning his name, but he's got some really good basic tips for setting up your Sounder. And like I said, um, it's more so setting up um, where you like to see your temperature, whether that's big or small, and all those minute things. In terms of actually setting it up for seeing fish, one, make sure that it's mounted correctly on the boat or the kayak or whatever, because that's your biggest killer. Um, if you haven't mounted it correctly, you're not going to, you know, see too much, especially when you travel fast, um, uh, you know, with your petrol. Two, um, you want to. Um, I've got lost lost track of my mind. Give me a sec. Um, so let me have a look at the question. Just popped off my screen. Uh, sorry, I was just taking it down. Let me find it. All again. right. <laughs> so the question was about setting up the HGS. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so number one, making sure it's on uh, your boat correctly. Uh, number two is um, setting up all those little things. Like I said, the temperature, how big you want to see it. And then number three is selecting auto to start with. Auto is a really good starting point and just making minor changes up and down through there. Um, if you're not seeing much on auto, have a look at your sound replacement. That usually is um, the reason why you're not having a good reading. Yeah, so much comes down to that transducer placement, doesn't it? So important. So a question from uh, from Nick, the link app. Any thoughts on that? I haven't used it a lot, to be honest. So I've, I've used it a little bit, and from what I've um, – used it for it's been fine um in terms of having glitches and that sort of stuff i haven't had glitches but i'm not a huge um user of um the app okay uh thank you liam for that comment so he's learned heaps already and he's committed to his very first cod trip this weekend all the best mate i hope you get on it and i hope I hope you get onto a fish and i hope that this session helps you <laughs> so dragon what size diameter will be a twig as referred to as a stick um they're actually, believe it or not, there actually are some standards that, that apply here. I don't know what they are, but there are sizes that, that are applied by aquatic scientists when it comes to the size of um, uh, of timber that's underwater as, in terms of fish habitat and uh, aquatic macroinvertebrate habitat and that sort of thing. But I can't tell you what they are. So, Dragon, I'm not sure if that was a serious question or if you were uh, just, just out for a bit of a laugh, but there, and there actually is. So if you Google it, you'll find that there is a standard there somewhere. Don't don't underestimate um, a, a stick or a twig because they can often do you in when you're talking about cod. So, yeah. All right. Do you want to zap over and have another look at a screenshot, mate? Let's um, let's maybe throw one of those up. So, um, we'll go to another one because the video will actually um, show this happening in real time. Um, so, okay, what you're looking at here is um, some fairly shallow water. Um, this particular time, there were golden perch and Murray cod coming through the screen. And what you're seeing here is a golden perch on the bottom and what's likely a cod swimming up over the top of it. And I know this because I was sitting on these fish for a fair while and I could see fish swimming in and out for minutes and you know, probably I think it was about 20 minutes on end. Um, and these cod were trying to corral these golden perch, and you'll often see them swimming in a pattern. 
And what, one thing that you'll find when you start to get used to your sounder is fish generally have a little bit of a circuit. When they're active and they're feeding, they'll just continually come in and around, in and around. And that's what these fish were doing. So you can often confuse uh, golden perch for Murray cod. So I mentioned before, you're seeing a thick line, let's just say in 10 metres of water, that's a big fish. You're seeing a thick line in three and a half metres of water, could easily just be a decent sized golden perch. So sometimes it's a bit of a guessing game, but I knew for a fact that that was a cod over the top moving in on these golden perch and it was just swimming around for about 20 minutes. There you go. All right. So a question from um, Kalina Miller. So where can you get some good info on linking live to motor guide and to an iPad to an iPad to live as well? Okay. So um, I used to have an XI5 and I linked it to my Laurent sounder and that was a um, HDS gen two touch. Um, There's plenty of videos out there. So I think I was, I mean, when I first started doing it back in the day, um, I think I just searched um, XI5 um, to HDS. Um, There's a, a lot of videos out there from America which will help you. There's a couple here from Australia too, so simple as that. Just go onto YouTube um, and type in HDS XI5 connection. Yeah, and if you get stuck, contact the guys at Laurent's. They're more than happy to help out. So jump onto their Facebook page, post a question there. They'll get back to you with some with some help and some advice. So Peter K, g'day, Peter. Welcome, mate. So Peter's asking, uh, what speed are you searching at normally? So I, I think he's probably referring to when you're looking for fish before you oh. actually found them. So yeah, so um, I fish, when I'm fishing in Canberra, I'm fishing electric only dams. So I've got to, you know, luckily have a 10 horsepower electric torpedo transom uh, motor. Um, so my traveling speed in general is around the five kilometer mark. That's just my normal traveling, uh, oh, about seven and a half kilometers, sorry. Um, so I'm scanning from anywhere from just taking it easy on the bank at three kilometers to seven and a half kilometers. Um, when I'm traveling with my petrol, I'm just putting around. So it's a similar sort of speed. Um, I'm not really, you don't really search when you're going flat out. You're really searching for um, the bottom when you're doing that sort of fast movement. Um, for me, um, a lot of the times I'm actually just using my bow mount, so my Lorance Ghost, just to um, trickle on through and see what's there. If I see something I like, I'll spot lock or sit on there and um, just observe and see what the fish are doing and whether they're moving or sitting high up in the water and that sort of stuff. Hmm. So a question from Wayne Willis. So Wayne says he's got a base model hook two, uh, 7TS. He's having trouble with screen picture being grainy. Is there anything he can do to improve it? And also what is better to use on the side and down scan, 455 or 800 kilohertz? So let's start with the first question first. What can we do about graininess of our image? Um, well, that particular sounder was obviously superseded by the hook reveals, so I haven't used that particular model. Um, but if it is grainy, um, I guess it really depends on if it's grainy because of the transducer itself or if it's mm. grainy because you've got a lot of clutter and stuff in the water. So if you're fishing a river that has a lot of inflow, for example, and you've got twigs and you've got some algae and all that sort of stuff moving through, it can look grainy because of the sensitivity, and that's when you would adjust your sensitivity accordingly for that application. So it's a bit of an open-ended question. I know it's a question that you're looking to get answered, but there's a little bit more to it than you know, how do I fix this? You've got to find out the problem before you can really work out what the solution is. Might be worth taking it in. If you if it's something that you need help with, take it into the local Lawrence dealer and, and see if you can get some advice. Get someone to have a look at the transducer placement and, and that sort of thing because that's obviously the first thing. And, and then get on to Lawrence and I'm sure they'll give you some help. So we've got Graham Fifield. Graham, you have just asked the golden question and you're going to, I think, be very happy with the answer. So Graham's saying, all of the Winter Cod podcasts, I'm assuming you're talking about my podcasts, uh, Jacko <laughs> Davis, Colby Lesko, Thomas Pinter at the moment are all casting big baits in the shallows. Yep. Um, does vertical fishing work all year round? And do you vertical jig plastic swim baits and hard vibes? And I tell you what, mate, we're going to be talking about that in some detail, I suspect, in just a moment. Yeah, um, there's a good video on that big fish that I caught um, doing the vertical stuff. But, um, look, they're doing great things with um, casting the bank. Um, unfortunately, I haven't done as much as they've done, but um, asking the question about can you do it all year round, yes, without a doubt. 
I don't care how cold it is, how hot it is, it actually is better to vertical work when it's stinking hot because those fish will be moving down to cooler water. And um, those fish that are cold, for example, and coming up in winter are going to move up and down the bank until they reach that comfortable water temp. So I like to call it the cod drop. So when, when a fish is coming up to get that sun in the winter, for example, they're not going to sit there all day. Um, they're going to come up and get their sun and then swim back down to a comfortable water temperature and drop back down. So that's where I refer to the cod drop. So I like to target the fish vertically when they're in that cod drop position. Um, don't get me wrong. If I know the fish is sitting up shallow, I'm going to be chucking my big plastics, my hard baits and that sort of stuff at them too. But there's a bigger window for when the fish are sitting deeper. That's why vertically fishing for them is so beneficial once you work out the patterns for your waterway. Mm -hmm. And you'd be pleased to know also, Graham, that I have enlisted Roman to come on board and do a podcast for us in the very near future. So we may get a little bit more information on some of that in due course. So, Roman, for the moment, we've got a, a pause in the questions. Guys, if you've got any other questions, continue to fire them through, but it's probably a good time for us to jump back over to the uh, to the screenshots, mate. Now, what I'm going to do, I just realised that I'm – you're seeing my cursor and it might be a bit confusing because I'm doing multiple things at once. So let me just turn that pointer off and that'll make it a little bit, a uh, little bit cleaner for those that are watching. So uh, that, that one we've already talked about, what are we looking at here? Okay. So what you're looking at here is a bit of a, um, a, a twig pile on your left. And then you've got a couple of fish just sitting off that um, flat there that or that rise that's coming into the flat. So, um, I mentioned before that um, I like to target my fish that are sitting tight on the bottom because they are the active fish nine times out of ten. So they're just sitting down the bottom ready to ambush and they're sitting next to this um, bit of structure here. So when I see this, I get excited. So if I'm seeing fish, let's just say a nice big cod sitting in five metres in that particular screenshot, I'm not that excited because a lot of the times they're not going to be the fish that are on the move um, they're going to be the fish that are sitting up in a comfortable water temperature and it's really hard to get them to bite. So I'm looking for those fish on the bottom and this is a good example of running your down, structure down scan and your sonar together because looking on your left-hand side there on the traditional sonar, the orange one, um, some people might not be able to distinguish that as a fish. And one of the old rules that I was taught was, oh, if it's sitting on the bottom, if it's attached to the bottom, it's a log. No, it's not the case a lot of the time, and that's where this new technology and you know, fish reveal and the structured downscan really comes into its own because you can clearly see on the right-hand side that they are fish sitting just off the bottom. Um, so that's what you're seeing in this particular screenshot. Um, I'm a bottom hunter, and that's where 9 out of 10 um, hits or takes or fish that I um, encounter, I actually catch all right. So another question we've got coming through from, uh, let me just bring you back on the screen, mate. So we've got a, a question from Andy Lindsay. Uh, how far does the beam from a sounder scan around the boat on down scan? Is there a ratio that you use for every one metre down? It's one metre radius of scans. Um, I sort of feel it when I'm out there. So I don't actually go into like measuring the sounder. You can actually go in and measure on the sounder itself. But um, generally I'm, when I'm targeting fish directly under the boat, I do notice that fish do often swim in. So if we're looking at this is my boat, this is the edge of the boat, um, I would um, say on this scale, two to three metres on the outside is where you'll start seeing the fish come in. Um, so that's as simple as I can explain it. But um, when you're vertically working, you're really only targeting what's underneath you. So um, when you introducing your live site and you'd be able to um, project out in front of the boat or wherever you're pointing that transducer, that's when you can pick up um, the range a little bit clear, clearer and that's what I have been doing with the live site recently. Um, so if, you, if you're just down scanning, just think two metres, three metres left of the actual boat edge is what you'll be catching. Okay, cool. So Graham's question is, what do we mean when we're talking about vertical fishing? Literally dropping it straight down. So you see something on the sounder, 
you drop it straight down, you're free spooling it all the way to the bottom, you're waiting for your lure to hit the bottom, then you're clicking it into gear and you're giving it a few rips and wraps, letting it sink. And I kind of refrain from um, constantly just reeling up to the top, dropping it to the bottom and up, up, up the, getting it back up in the water column. Um, I like to keep it on the bottom and just hop it around and even um, move your electric and, you know, move five to ten feet in front, hop it. It's kind of like a slow trawl, but you're controlling the trawl. You're stopping it, you're starting, you're stopping and starting. I will prefer to do that than actually reel up, move ten metres, drop, reel up, move ten metres, drop. So hmm. You're effectively covering more bottom that way. Exactly. Let's bring up another screenshot. So tell us what we're looking at here, Roman. Okay, so you're looking at about... 10 to 13 metres there, so off that drop-off, and that's a substantial fish that's sitting up high. So um, that is what I was explaining before. When you see, when I see fish that are sitting high up in the water column, I mean, I may drop it down because it's the only fish I've seen in the last half hour and have a you know, quick go at it, but I won't let the lure sink to the bottom. Um, these are the fish that are not active. They're up there for a reason, and if there's no bait around, generally that means they're just found that comfortable water temperature and they're really hard to tempt. If you go back one more, um, that is what I'm looking for. You're looking for those fish that are just tied up against the bottom. That is a fish and that's a big fish and it may look like a log to a lot of people, but that's 100% a fish. That gets me a lot more excited than seeing an arch sitting a few metres off the bottom. Okay. Um, this particular screenshot is when I was fishing your deeper water. You can see that the water temperature is 18 degrees. So we're in that warmer period of the year. Um, so that's when I like to go a little bit deeper. And you've got a bit of um, a little bit of tree sitting down there and a lot of spindly stuff. So that's like a little um, sideways um, little bush and you've got to, a fish sitting just off on the left-hand side, off a little hump. So that is more likely going to be an active fish. It's sitting around structure, so it's ready to ambush, and it's in that strike zone. So I'll just be dropping my lure straight away and being ready because dropping your lure, you've got to be on your game because you can get hit as soon as that lure comes close to the bottom. Those fish can just come straight up, and you can see a straight line coming up, and before you know it, they've caught the lure halfway down. So that's the prime bit of um, native territory and perfect for vertical working. Yeah, good stuff. Now, we've got a couple more questions that have come up. So Jack Lancaster again, what's your opinion on how to or how deep to fish and what depth is too deep? I don't think anything is too deep. I think it's the patience of the person waiting for their lure to get down, which is actually going to be the problem rather than being too deep. Wherever the fish are sitting and it's close to the bottom, I'm very confident that I can catch them. If they're sitting high in the water column, let's just say it's a 40-metre drop-off, they're sitting in 20 metres, don't bother. If they're sitting in that 30-metre range, I've caught natives down to about, I think it was 32 metres when the water was up at Gurgong, working the bottom, and that's even golden perch down that deep as well. But the one thing that I'll say is if you're targeting fish in deep water, make sure that you understand that you've got to try and bring them up slowly. Sometimes that's not possible, but barotrauma is a thing. It's not just salt water. And um, being able to release the fish as well, whether that's needling the fish, just popping that air bladder so it allows that pressure just to dissipate and then they can swim back down, or using a release weight. Um, just before you go deep water jigging or even anything from 6 to 10 metres in the right time of year or the wrong time if you're looking at it that way can cause barotrauma, particularly with golden perch. Cod, not so much. Um, yeah, just look up on YouTube how to vent fish or, um, yeah, how to relieve that yeah. barotrauma. In fact, when you're fishing really deep, you know, that last 10 metres is actually when the most of the damage happens. So the, the volume of air in the swim bladder doubles in, in volume from 10 yep. metres deep to the surface. so And from 20 metres deep to 10, it's only a third uh, bigger expansion. So 
it's really that last 10 meters you, you've really got to try and yeah not bring them up too quickly but yeah definitely anything anything more than five or six meters you need to be thinking about how am i going to release this fish without um you know and giving you a good chance to to survive so and just adding to that um like golden perch are extremely um fragile fish when it comes to um barrage roller you don't lose a lot if you know what you're doing I would say the success, the success rate in releasing for me is probably in the 95% range um, or, or higher. But um, golden perch, let's just say you've got a school of golden perch coming up, and this is a great example when you're vertically working soft plastics up a tree line in those tree dams. A lot of people are doing that these days. You're reeling up the soft plastic. You can see a school of yellow lily coming up, um, and that fish will grab your lure from a metre and a half underneath the surface, and from that point on, they can get barotrauma. It's literally, you just, mm. it's like you hook a fish in the lip, a golden perch in the lip, all the other golden perch that are coming up with it, nothing happens to them. They go straight back down, but just putting a hook through their lip can set it off. So you've got to really be switched on with your release practices. Mm. Mm. Well, there's also a bit of lactic acidosis starts to happen once you've hooked a fish and, and it's had a bit of a, a battle. Uh, so that that also exacerbates the problem. So good, good question. So we've got a question from Kelvin, and he's asking on the downscan split, what frequency do you usually use? So he's saying he's guessing you use high chirp on the sounder as well. Yeah, I like I said, I leave it on auto. Um, I don't fiddle too much with um, the frequencies, um, and you don't really need to in the freshwater aspect when you're fishing shallower water. And when I say shallower water, I mean one metre to 30 metres. That's really shallow in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, when you're going out onto the reefs and that sort of stuff in the salt, that's your true deep water. So you don't really need to do too much at all, if any. Okay. Question from Rick. Do you use a lead trap on your crankbaits? A lead trap? Are you meaning a um, a uh, a weighted bit of lead? I'm a, I'm a bit unsure what lead trap is. Give, give us a little bit more information, Rick, if you can um, just get, you know fill that question out a little bit because I'm not sure what you mean by that. I one think either, he means so. a, I think he means a chin weight. And if you are um, okay. being a chin weight, no, I don't. Okay. All right. Uh, one from Andy Lindsay. So surface fishing for cod in winter? Yes or no? Yes. Um, I mean, dams can be a little bit touchy, um, especially when they're not open at night time. Um, so Gugong, for example. But I, I, there's nothing more than I love than going out to the Murrumbidgee here in Canberra and doing a bit of surface fishing at night time or even in the daytime. It's, it's just amazing. It's awesome, for sure, 100%. Yep, all year round for that except for the springtime where the rivers are closed and you shouldn't be near the river if you're trying to catch a Murray God. Well, I didn't say that because it goes without saying and nobody <laughs> who's watching this <laughs> this broadcast will be doing that. So Scott's asking, what's the shallowest that you'd vertically jig? A metre. I mean, wherever I see fish, but, I yeah, a metre generally. Uh, and and he's saying his last question is more so uh, directed at impoundment cod. So would you fish for them, surface fish for them in impoundments over winter was the question. Yes, um, I do. I did when I was at Barranjuk. I failed. Um, <laughs> I've had a surface hit at Gurgong fishing during the middle of the day in the winter, last winter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Once you've caught fish on the surface, even though you know that percentage is going to be quite low, you're still going to do it. Like, you're going to do it because you know that feeling. So, I mean, yep. other dams, I know Eildon does really well on surface and that sort of stuff. So if I was there, yeah, definitely. All right. Let's jump back to our screenshots, mate. We've got a few more to go through yet, and then we've got some vision as well to show, which I'm sure is going to help a lot of people too. So talk us through what we're seeing on our screen now, Roman. Okay, so um, this is a perfect example of um, deviating um, depths. So when I'm vertically working, I get really excited when I see changes in depth, particularly when you've got a weed bed mixed in with that. So what you can see here is on that high point, you've got a big thick weed bed 
and you've got two drops on either side. So this is a really good ample spot for predators, whether they're sitting within those Vs, just alongside that weed bed, or they're sitting in that weed. So what you're seeing on the left, the traditional sonar, is a really thick blob in that weed. It's really hard to see what's in there. Um, the trained eye, I can see a few fish sitting there, but it's really hard. And then you flick over to the right-hand side where you've got the um, fish reveal and the structure down scan, and it highlights what's sitting in and around that weed a little bit easier. So this is really a comparison between the two different um, types of uh, sonar readings but also just highlighting the fact that you want to really look for that deviation and that is a perfect scenario just to sit on and try and work out what's in that weed. Yeah. So Rick's just come back. He said, yep, he was talking about lead tape. So you got to love the old, <laughs> you got to love the old autocorrect on your phone, don't you? I'm guessing yep. what you're saying incorrectly, but yeah. Yeah. No, I've, um, I've only experimented with lead tape back in the day when I was, putting them on heavy, big lures, um, but not vertically, no. I just choose uh, um, applicable uh, vibe for the scenarios. So the one thing that I really like about these um, rip and wraps is they're a decent size. They're 70 mil, so they're not too small. They're not too big, but they're quite heavy and nose heavy. So when I'm fishing that deeper stuff and even the shallower stuff, I can fish it a lot more effectively and, and faster. So they're quite a compact lure, and they've got that – a really loud rattle and um, they sink nose down very quickly. So it's really choosing that lure for the application. Um, when you're fishing slightly shallower stuff, for example, um, the lures that I've been experimenting with lately, which are only new on the market and I've done quite well on in the colder months, are the um, Rapala V Blade. And they're a little bit lighter, a little bit smaller in profile. And um, yeah, just really choosing the lure for the depth of water is the main thing and then again having um different vertical rods handy is really really big key because if you want to use a slightly lighter lure because it's working and you want to get it down deeper just down downsize to like 30 pounds or 25 pound um and get that lure down there faster if you want to you know get a higher chance of the action for that lure that's actually producing the goods all right, I'm going to switch back to the screenshots, Roman. So we've got four fish sitting together off the hard flats. You do. Um, so I actually caught number four here. Um, so this is um, just scanning through and um, finding your active fish. So you've got four golden perch sitting here, and this is actually off a little bit of structure that's not in the sonar beam. Um, and these fish are moving up and down and around. You can see that number four actually was a little bit higher before I took this screenshot. So number four was more like where number three was. You can see my lure descending. So there's a line on that um, screenshot and um, that fish has just followed my line to the bottom. So this is what I mean about active fish. This isn't really deep water. So the whole thing about me saying that there's a fish sitting in five metres in a 10-metre range, I wouldn't get too excited for, but this is a six-metre range with fish sitting in four metres, so it's only two metres to the bottom. When you start to see the squiggly lines, those fish are moving, so they are actively hunting or on the prowl for something. So um, that's what gets me really excited is seeing that movement and I know that these are golden perch even without catching them because this particular dam does not have carp. So if you've got a carp infested waterway, you're going to get confused with what you're actually seeing um, because carp do like to move in squiggly lines. But that's what this screenshot's all about. All right. So another question from Linton. He's asking whether you get many redfin hit the uh, hit the wraps. Yeah, no matter how big or small your lure is, you're going to get redfin. Um, I was experimenting with a big soft vibe, which was actually, uh, I think it was close to 25 to 30 centimetres, and I'm catching redfin, which, you know, are half its size. So um, if, you, if you're going to be working a school, for example, of redfin and wanting the native fish to come in, um, I would use something that's your mid-range size because um, when you actually catch those redfin and hook them um, is where you get more of the um, – 
cod coming in and the natives coming in the golden perch and that sort of stuff so if you want to hook them and get that commotion just downsize a little bit but don't go down to your redfin style you know five centimeter lures because you know a cod comes in and grabs that and they do you're going to be really hard pressed to actually land it all right we're going back to our screenshots now mate this looks a bit like loch ness you found here <laughs> yeah so this is um me finding fish that were sitting hard up on the bottom um, and my lure is bouncing up and down so I don't know how many you can count there but right on the bottom there's like little triangles that's my lure just jigging on the bottom and that fish following that lure up actually following that lure down um, so fish what you'll find with golden perch and even Murray cod is when they're active, they're going to be doing a lot of moving and that's when you want to be moving your lure away from them as well. So as much as I've talked about dropping your lure straight down and just jigging up and down, when you have those active fish and you've learnt their patterns and they start following your lure in, that little bit of movement away from that position will actually result in a fish hooking up. And it, it's the same thing as... Let's just say you're casting at sticks in a river. Um, on the right-hand side of the log, you get a hit. You cast there for another 10 times. You don't get a hit. You move. You cast from a different angle. That fish is going to hit first time. So it's a similar sort of concept to that. So just moving when the fish are moving and giving them that sense of that lure, just tracking away. All right. Now we've got one screenshot left, mate, so I'll bring that up. Let me just... Find my way down to it. I think that might have been it, actually. There it is. Uh, yep, yeah, cool. Um, so, again, this is just a little bit of undulating bottom um, coupled with a bit of weed and a bit of um, structure in the, in the form of a couple of trees. So when you find little crevices like this and you see those fish hugging tight up against the bottom, that is your signal to go down to those fish and start working. Um, when the fish are really, really active, they're going to be hitting you on the way down, on the bottom. You can leave your lure sitting there and the fish will grab it. So the way that I've learnt that is I've fished with two rods a lot of the times, one in one hand, one in the other hand. I drop one down, free spool it. Don't ever let a rod sit there and not be free spooled because you'll lose your rod. Go drop the other one down and my line will just start ticking away. And then I'll crank into gear, bang, I have fish. So that's happened countless times. So when they're really switched on and sitting on the bottom, just be really switched on yourself and those fish will grab you on the bottom a lot of the time when they're really, really firing. All right. So, mate, I've got a question from Andy. This is going to send you into palpitations because – it's like one that I asked during the podcast, and I try and limit my guests to three lures, mate, one cod lure. If you'd only take one, what would it be? Oh, man. <laughs> it's really tough because as good as, lipless, man, Andy. as, as, good as um, uh, lipless crankbaiting on the bottom is, sometimes you just, it's hard-pressed to go past casting a big bait and getting that big smack you know, on the turn. A cod on the turn and that power is just phenomenal. But... Uh, one lure, I would go R Rapala Rip and Wrap. It's a tough yeah, choice, yeah. but cool. the amount of fish and the amount of action you get vertical working uh, in the right conditions is yeah, tenfold of what you can generally catch casting the bank. In the waterways that I fished, it might be different elsewhere, but I've, I've done enough travelling and enough um, native fishing in these waterways to realise that it's not just a pattern here locally. Hmm. All right, Raymond, we've gone through all of our screenshots. We're starting to run out of questions. They're slowing down as well. So, guys, if you've got questions, keep them coming. We're happy to keep talking and keep answering questions for as long as you want to keep asking them. Might be a good time to switch over and show a bit of vision, mate, about some big cod being caught. All right, no worries. Well, um, yeah, this this video, which um, we'll be showing um, from – dropping your lipless crankbait to the bottom and then hooking onto an absolute monster. The fight itself was just a mega long fight, so you're not going to get anywhere near the length of the mm -hmm. fight. But the whole point of this is showing you how easy it can be 
um, when you know what you're looking at and dropping your lure down and then literally just hooking up within the first like 10, 15, sometimes first second. All right, anyway. let's, let's hit it. Okay, we're back out here after a three month break. Dam's open again and as you can see there, we got some good natives coming through. We'll drop down this Rapala rip and wrap and let's see how long it takes. Get that down there and with the Lowrance HDS 12 Live, you can see that lure traveling down to the bottom. There's a fish down there. You can see a fish is just coming up here now, sitting on the bottom. My lures come up and down. Yep, got him. Got him. Oh, this one's a good one. This one's a good one, Pete. Oh, 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 this is a good fish. See, look at that. That's the cod. This is a very big cod. I can't do much. I'm lifting it now, Pete. Oh, I'm going to... Yeah, yeah, it's coming up now. Coming up. Yeah, head, head. You'll see the head in a second. Go, go. go. Turn the head. Turn. Turn it. Turn it. Pull it up. Pull it up. Get in there. Get it. Get, get, let me get the tail. Let me get the tail. Woo! Oh! <laughs> Pretty excited. Where was that one taken, mate? Uh, when or where? Where, uh, where? Oh, when as well. That was Gugong. Um, so that was this uh, season. Um, I think it was late March. Mid to late March is when Gugong opened after being shut for a little while. So, yeah, um, it was the fish that I've been after for a long time. I've caught you know, a lot of fish um, vertically working and um some meter fish too, but I've lost some really big ones and a year, I think it was actually a year to the day of that fish that I caught. The year prior, I lost a really big one during the Pertec doing the same thing um, or very similar thing. Um, and I was haunted for a year, haunted. And then, um, yeah, I was very relieved to get one that size doing that. I've caught fish up around that length over the years, but haven't had a real official measure because I've been by myself and I'm just glad that that one I had a friend on board and um yeah officially the 130 club but you know I think it was more the the method that I caught that one and been trying so hard to get a fish of that size with that method um and yeah that's that, that's a special part of that fish yeah, yeah, Andy. Yes, it is a great fish, and the excitement is palpable. So, we got another question from uh, Kevin. So, Kevin's saying sometimes Gugong has you know, huge patches of deep weed. Can you see fish in it, or do you just skip over it? Yes, you can. Um, like I was alluding to on the one of the splits on the screenshots, there you've got the structure down scan with the fish reveal. Um, that actual mode within the Laurent Sounders uh, gives you the ability to almost just hone in through that weed and see the solid sitting behind that. So um, I, when I see weed, I still get excited. Um, and, I mean, that's the big reason why I go to change into my assist hooks. Um, so when I fish that weed or that timber, I can fish it a lot more thoroughly without getting as much hang-ups um, and losing your lure or getting stuck in there and, missing that opportunity so really tailoring your gear to the scenario is the way to go not look at a big heavy weed bed and go oh this is crap you know my lure is getting caught up I, don't, I, I can't deal with this anymore you need to deal with it because dealing with it is going to be that difference a lot of the time to catching that really good fish that you're after hmm yep there's no point fishing places where there aren't fish because you just don't want to deal with where the fish are so good stuff. All right, mate, we've got one more piece of vision. Should we play that? And then we'll start to bring things to a close. So what are we going to be looking at next, mate? Okay, so what you're going to be looking at is um, me fishing with the Lowrance Live Sight. So for people that don't know, Live Sight um, gives you the ability to see what's in front of you. So um, in this particular instance, I think I had it set on 15 metres. So I was demonstrating um, the difference with free spooling your lipless crankbait, casting it out versus um, clicking your reel into gear. So what are the one of the big things that I find with um, people that are casting the banks, whether that's casting for a golden perch with um, blades and, you know, doing what I do and cast those bigger lipless crankbaits for cod, 
is they, as soon as the lure hits the water, they click it into gear. But this video is going to show you the um, opportunities that you lose when you're trying to work a bit of structure and how much room you actually lose with your lure if you click it straight into gear straight away. All right, let's hit it and see what it shows us. G'day, folks. I'm going to run through a couple scenarios when casting and trying to work the bottom with lures. So what I find a lot of the time is people are casting, let's say a lipless crankbait for example, and they're letting that lure fall and they're clicking the lure into gear straight away. You're gonna lose a lot of range. And look at this, there's a fish out here. I'm casting using my Lorentz live sight. So that's pretty good timing. I'm gonna cast out my lure about that 10 meter mark and we're just gonna let it free spool. So hopefully I have gone within that 10 meter range. I don't think I have, so let's just reel in get that lure into beam, which is there. Look, it's going straight on top of that fish now. And the lure's there, I'm just gonna jig it. Oh, how awesome is that? My lure's just here, I'm just gonna let that sink. And that fish was just hovering here and it's gone into the bottom. So I'm just gonna slowly jig that in. And this has inter interrupted my little demonstration, but it's a good interruption. That fish has just appeared, disappeared into this little bit of a weed pile here. Oh. So look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sacrifice that fish, but I'm going to continue with what I was trying to say. So I'm going to do two casts, two scenarios. First cast is casting about five, six meters, and I'm going to let the lure free spool. So I want you to see where it enters in, about seven meters, and it comes in at about five meters. So you lose about two meters in the distance that you want to fish. So now what I'm going to do now is cast out roughly in the same area, but this time I'm going to click it straight into gear. So I'm going to show you how much room you actually lose. So it started about seven and a half, and look at that, it's missing that crucial area, and we know that there was a fish that swam in to about this six meter range. But because you're not letting that freeze ball, your lure's just tracking, and look at that, it's missing the entire bottom here. So that's the big key for when you're trying to fish the bottom is not clicking your reel into gear too early because you're going to miss so much of the water. Great stuff, mate. A really, really good illustration of how to use your sounder and how to fish your lures. So tremendous stuff. And look, we're, we're getting towards the end of tonight's session. But we've got a few more questions coming up. So let's just knock those over, guys. If you've got any last-minute questions, please sling them our way. So. Eric's asking, do you reckon there are cod out there that might be bigger than 1.3 metres? A hundred percent. Like, you've got to look at, you know, um, Cod Mac, Rod McKenzie. You know, he's pulled up some absolute honkers in his time and his his mates and, you know, the Cod Almighty stuff. Um, you know, there's fish out there that I think are longer than what we think are out there in this day and age. Um, I mean, in Gurgaon. There's no doubt fish that are 1.5 metres. And a 1.5 metre fish out of Googong, my goodness, because they're built so differently to everywhere else, I just, I'm going to get one and I can't wait to show it. Um, but, yeah, there's definitely fish out there that are well over 1.5 metres and, um, you know, I reckon pushing 200 pound. Um, no question at all when they get to that size, particularly in a waterway and a dam um, with how big these and fat these fish are. So, yeah, I reckon 200 pounds, I reckon. We can do it. <laughs> Good stuff. Michael says, great video, guys. It's not great video, guys. It's great video, Roman. I had nothing to do with it, but I would love to say that, you know, it's been my pleasure to be able to bring it to you because you're the first people that have actually seen these videos. So uh, Roman's premiered them here on this masterclass, which is fantastic. So I really appreciate that. A uh, question from Andy, would you go so far as to say assist hooks are better than treble hooks for hookup rate or is it not so much for hookup rate but more about not getting so snagged up? Uh, I dare say, well, I do say that the assist hooks have a better staying in the mouth rate. Mm. So the hookup rate might not be as good. I haven't noticed a huge difference in it, to be honest, but it's when you get it in there, the assists rarely come out. And a good way just to, you know, touch on that too is um, when people like in the AYC, the Australian Yellow Belly Fishing Championships, right, a lot of people 
fishing for yellow belly. And they're catching Murray cod on blades and that sort of stuff. And the amount of fish that are caught just on those tiny, tiny assist hooks will blow your mind. So, yeah, mm. it, they stay in there. I think they just get in there. If they get into the fleshy part, they're really hard to get out. And that's why I was talking about before, when you upgrade your hooks, try and upgrade to the strongest, the, sorry, the the thinnest strong hooks that you can find opposed to getting those really thick trebles because you want to get your lure in there and the th the finer stuff is what stays in there longer. And a word of advice, guys, you won't find those thin, strong hooks in the bargain box at the tackle yeah. shop either. They, they tend to be a bit more exy, but worth their way to go. I guess the other thing, you know, for me, it's the age-old thing, isn't it? When you switch over from trebles to, to singles or assists, it's okay. Well, even if your hookup rate does drop, Two things. One is, as you've said, you, you have less hooks pull, so you lose less fish. But the other is you're able to fish places where you otherwise couldn't fish with treble, so you're probably going to get more bites. And so it's that trade-off between getting more bites and, yeah. and having perhaps a, a lower hookup rate. So I'd, I'd always go for more bites personally. But yep. Ben's question is, mate, do you troll in Gugong or do you mainly cast in there? Uh, I troll when I'm bored. Um, <laughs> and I don't get bored often, but... Um, I mean, I've had stretches out of Gugong where I've had 13 days without a touch, 13 days of winter fishing, no touch, not even a hint of a touch. And, um, you know, one day on, on trips like that, then I might just, you know, there's a nice rock wall there and my mind's just, ah, yeah, I'll just have a, have a sandwich or have something to eat and just do a bit of a trawl. But that's essentially when I trawl. If I'm fishing Barranjuk or other dams at night time, um, I may do a trawl just to have a bit of a lay down and close my eyes if I've got someone else in the boat, but not really. I'm I'm the cast in, the hunter, you know, trying to trick that fish into eating rather than mm -hmm. um, just trolling by and, yeah, hoping one hits you. And nothing against trawlers. If it works for you and you enjoy it, by all means do it. I know down the Murray it's fantastic, but for me I'm a caster. And, um, yeah, I rarely troll. You might have actually partially answered the next question too from Jeremy saying if you're marking fish, how long are you going to work an area if you're not getting a result? It goes back to where are those fish sitting in the water column? What do they look like they're doing? Are they sitting near structure or are they sitting near bait fish? It's hard to go away from a big cod when you see it, even if they're sitting a little bit further up off the bottom. You still want to give it a go because, you know, it's a bit cut. Um, but generally I will stick around. If I feel that a fish is not active, I give it two minutes. If I feel that I can get that fish active by what I'm seeing <clears throat> that that fish is doing, then I'll stay there for five to ten minutes. But it's very rare for me to stay in a spot for one fish for more than ten minutes. If there's a fish working a school of golden perch or there's a fish circling and he's coming back to where I am because I know that's his little track that he's been doing, also I can sit there for an hour. But it really depends on the situation. But nine times out of ten, within five minutes I'm gone. Okay, cool. Uh, Trevor from Newcastle, nice to know you here, mate. Trevor's uh, – Someone that I've known through fishing for a little while, he's asking, Roman, can you be his new best friend? So um, I, I'm sure you'd be only too happy to. So, uh, well, let me I'll show you hand if I see you on the water after COVID. <laughs> Trevor's a very good bloke too. He'd be a good guy to go out for a fish with. So let me have a scroll through. We've still got a couple of questions. I've just got to find them. So uh, Grant's asking what improvements we can expect with the next Lawrence transducer release. Are you up to date with the new developments in Lawrence and are we at liberty to discuss them? I have not heard about detailed information at all. Um, I think it's one of those things where you're going to find out when it's here. Um, and yeah, I, I, I can't tell you much more than that. I don't know it, so I'm not going to try and make it up. <laughs> Best thing to do. All right, so Jeremy's question is, uh, have you tried slow pitch jigging with metals or spoons like the palms, uh, spoons or those sorts of things? I did a little bit, but that was when I first started working in the Redfin schools. Um, but after hearing Dean Sylvester's episode previously with the bass, I want to go do some stuff like that on the bass. 
<laughs> Dean did a great podcast interview with me a little while back, or quite a while back now, on Somerset Bass, and he talked about various different palm spoons and how to work them, and it was a very entertaining episode. So I'll send you the link to that afterwards, Roman. So we've got a question from Dale. He's saying, would you ever fish without a sounder and just enjoy the hunt, or is sounder fishing the only way to go for you? Um, in the past, I've fallen in the trap of a few people saying the sounders turn the fish off, so turn your sounder off. Um, the only time that I did that was early on in the piece, and while I've the time that I've experimented, I haven't found too much of an issue with it at all. Um, I prefer to see the fish, and even if it turns them off a little bit, I can just go to other fish. Like there's, you got mm. a world of opportunities with your sounder. Um, so the only time it turns off is when my batteries run out. <laughs> Good That's answer. It. All right. So Peter K, are you picking up fish on the side scan as well? Any um, shots? I, I didn't have any screenshots, but yeah. I did have shots. Um, I just didn't expect this to go for much longer than it had. Um, I'm wishing now that I did, but <laughs> I do. As I mentioned before, I have the sound, um, the side scan on, particularly when I'm getting close to a bank or a bit of structure that I know, um, because the fish, like I said, they generally work in a track, and they come and are up back, back and around when they're um, when they're active. So. I have the side scan on in those applications specifically because I want to see where they're moving to. Mm. Um, and the great thing is on the side scan, um, if you've got the side scan and the down scan happening at the same time, you can just click on the side scan and you can kind of get a really good indication of exactly where they are, um, then move over and have a look and see what's there. So um, I'm way more in tune with my structured down scan and my down scanning. I am getting better with my side scan. I'm not as good as a lot of other people out there, but I do still use it and I do get results from my side scan. All right. Good stuff. So uh, Paul Geddes is asking, what's your YouTube channel? Uh, I've had a couple over the years, but um, Roaming Productions Oz, O-Z, is my um, YouTube channel. I haven't done a lot on YouTube um, over the last few years. I primarily just do my stuff through Facebook and my Roaming Productions Australia page. Um, I may get it going a little bit harder in the future, but if you want to find out more up-to-date stuff with what I'm doing, the Facebook page is your number one bet with that one. All right. And the lucky last question, unless we have any last-minute ones come through. So Dale's asking, what's your go-to crankbait for cod? Again, so, one more question. <laughs> so I'm assuming that's a bid crankbait or... Well, we, we, we've covered the lipless cranks, yeah. haven't we? So let, let's right, do a big one. Okay, I don't have one in what front of wrong, me here. I'll tell us and we'll, we'll do another one. But That's cool. Um, well, the first Murray cod I've ever caught was on a Storm Magwort, which is the bigger version of the Storm Wigglewort. Mm. And um, I still got that lure. Um, so I would say that my Magwort is my favourite. Um, I've still got heaps of them. Um, I've caught so many fish on them in the river. I've caught fish on them in the dams. Um, I would say if I had to choose one, it would be the magwort. Um, yeah, the magwort. There you go. And Dale said, yes, he was after a bibbed crankbait, so that's answered that question beautifully. Roman, mate, we've been going for an hour and a half. You must be getting parched. I know I am. We've had some great interactions. So thanks to everybody that came along. Thanks for some amazing questions. And, look, it's been a lot of fun. So. Really appreciated having you along tonight, mate. And uh, really, I've learned some some great stuff. Can't wait to talk to you on the podcast as well. So thanks so much for giving us your time and sharing your screenshots and, and some of your knowledge and wisdom because I'm sure it's helped a lot of people that are going to go out there and have a crack at the cod and maybe try that vertical fishing that they haven't necessarily tried before. So really appreciate that. Yep. Got a couple just a last question coming through here from Mick. He's saying, do you use scent or not when you lure? <laughs> Oh, good old Mick. Um, <laughs> he knows that I love the garlic scent. Um, <laughs> the garlic. I mean, I do scent my. Um, I do scent my lures. I, I. I don't go overboard with it. Um, I find that it does work in applications, but it's not one of those things that I always put on. Um, I mean, 
the scent that I prefer, to be honest, is the old squidgy scent. That squidgy um, scent is just diabolical for the whole scheme of different scents from salt to fresh. Um, but if I do scent, I put on a little bit. So what I find is that um, with most scents out there that I've used over the years, that I, if I smeared it on, it's almost an off put to the fish or putting them off. I find more of a success rate with just dabbing a little bit on because you don't want something to over smell, if that makes sense. That's what I found. Um, but yeah, occasionally I do. When the fishing gets tough, I break the scent out. <laughs> Great way to finish off. So really appreciate that, Roman. Mate, I'm going to let you go now. In fact, we're all going to let you go. So once again, guys, thank you for coming along. Thank you again to Navico and to Lawrence for putting these on and allowing us to come and bring you this information. And, uh, and guys, of course, we have got some more to come, so I'll talk about the next one in just a moment. But first of all, thanks, Roman, for your time. And, yeah, no, we really no appreciate you coming along. Now, folks, we do have coming up next week, we're going to have a bit of a break, but we do have coming up next uh, 24th of August, so two weeks' time, uh, we've got Matt Hooper coming along, and he's going to give us a presentation on the the Simrad Evo 3, so make sure you come along for that. Uh, going to be a little bit more technical. We're going to go through everything you need to know about that particular unit. So, folks, once again, thank you for coming along. Thank you for spending some time with Roman and myself. It's been fantastic having you here. And I look forward to the next uh, Masterclass episode, and I'll see you then. Bye for now.